Good evening, good afternoon. I think I am live. I think you can hear me and you can see me. If that is the case or if that is not the case, can you confirm that for me that you can hear me and you can see me, please? And as you noticed, we have still this funny popcorn sound and it hasn't been fixed. Um, so I'm just gonna call Jay from Skype and Jay is gonna help us to look at the Islamic coins. A um, couple of weeks ago we went to the British Museum with Jay and then we kind of looked at the uh, his uh, looked at the exhibition where British Museum put together the history of Islam and in that uh, short video Jay talked about Islamic coins and I have received a couple of emails people wanted it to be unpacked so Jay is kindly agreed to join us in another live stream to help us to do so. So I'm just gonna call Jay and by the grace of God hopefully everything will work well. Of course if Jay is there, last time when I called him he wasn't there. Hello, Atu. Hello, Jay. Peace Hello. of Christ be with you. How are you? You, I'm doing fine, but you look awfully tired. Because I am old. I'm getting old, Jay. You will You're never understand. Old. You will never I'm understand. You never there. get you old. You have no reason to be tired. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm doing okay. I just need my makeup and I need to get younger. Um, I don't think you even know what makeup is. How are you, Jay? I'm doing fine. Thank you for inviting me. Can I get a quick permission from you to be recorded on this live stream? Yes, fine. No problem. Thank you. Um, and those of you who are joining us in the chat, topic of tonight <laughs> is the Islamic coins. Can I gently encourage you to Please keep the conversations around the topic so everyone can benefit and we wouldn't um, waste, waste Jay's time because he's like pretty busy. Um, but what I'm going to do is I noticed we haven't listened worship songs for a while. Actually, no, I don't know how to do that now. Anyway, nothing. I'm doing nothing. Um, Jay, can you tell us how have you been since um, last week? What have you been up to? I have been in academic isolation. I am in a, a really nice little cabin uh, near the mountains. Uh, I guess I'd call it a cabin, but I'm completely alone. And uh, that's for, uh, for a reason. I'm writing a book and I'm trying to get the book finished. And the best way to do that is to be in isolation. And uh, that I have another two or three days before I leave this place. Uh, so it's been great to, uh, I think we had a, a, a live stream last week and I had another one on Fander Films with Fadi Al Fadi on, on Saturday, uh, last Saturday. So this has been the third live stream I've done while I've been in isolation. Now I'm back and we're gonna talk about this topic. I think the topic is on to concerning coins. Yeah, and um, so within um, three, four days, will you be finishing the book or you are just kicked out from the place you are staying? <laughs> no, I don't get kicked out. I've just decided that this is, I've got to get back to my wife. I've got to get back to my family. Uh, my, my, my son and his, uh, and his girlfriend are over from England and uh, they're here for Christmas. I've got to get home so that I can start uh, spending some time with my family and Christmas. And... Okay, do you want to tell us a little bit about what are the books you are writing or? 
What are the yeah, titles this, of the books? Book, this first book, I'm going through all the frequently asked questions, the FAQs, and how to answer them. People have been saying, when the videos are up there, we need something written down. So I'm taking all that I have been doing the last year. If you go up on Fander Films, I did about a sequence of about 40 different FAQs. What are the questions that are being thrown at us? How to answer them quickly and concisely. The, the three C's. You know the three C's, Hatunya. The quick, concise, yet comprehensive. Those are the three C's. And so I'm putting them into a book because people can't look at videos all the time. Uh, so that's why that's what I'm doing at this period. Now, the next one, of course, will be then the internal critique of the Quran, looking at all the internal problems with this book here. And the one that I'm also working on is the external critique of the Quran. That's the historical problems. I've been doing that with you. I've been doing that with Al-Fadi. Those are the that's looking at the 12 areas. There's 12 areas that I'm now confronting. Some of them I we introduced at Kensington Temple, KT, uh, in September when I was back in England. And then the, the other books that I'm writing on are looking at the scientific problems with the Quran and then, mo then moving on into the polemics. What are the best uh, questions to ask Muslims? What are the questions that we need to go that direction rather than always coming towards us? So those are the five books that I'm working on at the moment. I think the last book is going to be very easy. The last one, the polemics? Yeah, because, because <laughs> any question about Islam you ask Muslims, they have no answer. So your your book should be just in every page, just ask a question. Very, very, very good. It's what you're saying. No, what I'm, I'm not just going to put the question out there. I'm going to put the ask, why is it? And what's the background for the question? And what are the responses you're going to get? And how to then deal with those questions, yeah, those I, responses? I, I, I was just joking, yes. Um, okay, so... Um, you're going to use it. I'm going to use it. This is what, These are the areas that people have asked me to do. Okay. So, um, okay, um, just re reminding um, those of you who are watching, tonight's topic is Islamic coins. The ones we looked at at British Museum, so Jay is just going to um, go ahead and unpack that for us. Um, I think you would want me to share some pictures, Jay. Yeah, I think, why don't we start out? This is, and let's get some background as to why we're even doing this talk today. What's the purpose of the coins? The purpose of the coins has an awful lot to do with how did Islam really begin? And what is it that the British Muse uh, Museum is not aware of and which most Western scholars are not aware of? Uh, one of the things we have found out with a lot of Western scholars, and it's not, it's no discredit to them, uh, they're, they're not aware of what exactly how is some of the real problems with the historical the historical antecedents to Islam and how and not only historical antecedents but the narrative the classical narrative that they are using and we noticed that when I was there in September at the British Museum those of you who are in London go to the British Museum look at the two new galleries that they put up those two new galleries are dedicated to the greatness of Islam and it's really interesting and we brought this out in our in our video that we did earlier that these two galleries are dedicated to Islam there are no galleries dedicated to Christianity there are no galleries that I know that are in the British Museum that are dedicated to Hinduism or Buddhism or any other religion it's only these two galleries dedicated to Islam why in the world is Islam get this preferential treatment and more than that if they're going to get this kind of treatment why in the world are they using that classical narrative and the answer is very clear they don't have any other narrative but that, and it's the only ones that Muslims will allow them to use. But when we went into those galleries, the, almost the first things we looked at were these coins. And as soon as you showed me those coins, Hatun, and I don't know if you knew what you were looking at or if you were, or you were aware of the problems. Did, were you aware of it before you introduced them to me? Yes, I was aware of the dates. Okay, and what uh, you know, as soon as we looked at the coins, now let's put that picture up there. I saw you just had it up there. Put it back up there again. Just look at those coins, and these are the coins they have on display. And they're coins that, that are, according to their viewpoint, these are coins that, that uh, they consider to be symptomatic of what uh, the history of what was happening with Islam. What they don't know is they didn't look at the coins very uh, carefully. Look at the back row. Uh, do you have the coins up there yet? Yes, uh, coins are on the screen. Okay, look at the back row, and uh, the f the first two in the back, the first silver ones in the back, are not. I have I had listed one and two. Those are Sassanian coins. They're Zoroastrian coins. Those are not really germane to our discussion today. The only reason they're there is because the Sassanian uh, Empire 
predated Islam, and the Sassanian Empire existed up until the 7th century itself. So those coins are Zoroastrian, not really part of our discussion. The next two, three, four are also Sassanian. Uh, we do know that the Sassanians were destroyed by the Arabs, so that is significant. So these would be the last coins that existed before the Arabs came and took down that empire, that empire that existed in what is today, uh, what is today uh, uh, Iran and Iraq. Now, the one on the far right, number five, that is important, but I, I, it's, it's in the wrong sequence, so I'm going to come back to it. So let's don't even look at it because that's an 8th century coin. And I don't know, I mean, I, it's interesting because in, in the description that they have at the ba uh, on the bottom, they do mention this 8th century. Then I don't understand why they put it at the back there because that should be at the very end of all of these coins. Because then when we come down to the front row, look at the two gold coins on the front row. Those are hugely significant, and the British Museum doesn't seem to understand their significance, nor do they understand the significance of the ones in the middle. So the front row, you have two on the left. Those are number one and two. Those are Byzantine drachmas. In the middle are the number three and four are Abdel al-Malik's image. Those are the coins from Abdel al-Malik. That's very important. We're going to unpack that. And then the two on the right in the front row, the two, uh, two other gold coins are also, later, they're after, uh, well, no, they're not. They're also Abdel Malik, but they don't say Abdel Malik. And those would be the coin, they would have been introduced around 692. So, on the two on the left are prior to 661. These would be Byzantine drachmas. Those are earlier than, than uh, Islam. The ones in the middle are uh, between 685 and 692. 685 and 692, those are the two black ones. The two smaller coins, the black ones in the middle, and then the two on the right are hugely significant. And this is why I want to talk about it, because those should not be those coins. Those coins uh, say an awful lot. And none of the those who put the display together in the British Museum were aware of what they were putting together. And that's why you called me to go and unpack it. So let's look now at those two on the left, and then this, they we're going to introduce the two in the middle, and then we're going to introduce the two on the right. And let's follow that sequence. So let's start. If you put up the next image, which would be the Byzantine drachma. Let's take a look at the Byzantine drachma, if you could put that up. Okay, just before, while I find that picture, am I right to understand those uh, coins we looked None of them has anything to do with men called Muhammad. Nothing. Now, why is that significant? I would expect... Uh... If he is the greatest of all prophets, if he is the creator of Islam, if he is the one that, in, that receives the Quran, if he is the man living in Mecca that moves to Medina in 622, if he dies in 632, these are all post that time. These should be the earliest Muslim coins. Well, except for the first two. Let's Before we get to that, let's still talk with the drachmas before we get into that discussion, okay, Hatun? So let's look at the drachma. That's the Byzantine drachma, which is slide number 12. Yes, just a moment. I just couldn't find the picture, so I need to put that again. Okay. Now, while she's doing that, I'm gonna. What I'm gonna be introducing to you, we need to understand why the drachmas are significant. The drachmas are are a coin that was used both by the Byzantine, who are Christian, and also by the Sassanian, who are Zoroastrian. Okay. The Byzantines the were in the north. On the screen, Jay. Sassanians were in the east. You got them up there? I can't see on from what I'm looking at. I'm having to assume yeah. you've got them up there. It's going to come. So when we speak, people get to hear us approximately 20 seconds after we speak. Therefore, you will see you. Seeing the picture within 20 seconds. And sometimes 20 seconds can be seen a very, see, very now. long time. Yeah. There yeah. we've got the drachma. I see them up now. I'm, I've got another computer over here that I've got on silence so that I can see what you're putting up. Let's take a look at those drachmas. Now, when you look at those drachmas, you can see, look at the one on the left, the first one on the left. All right, can you see the one on the left? Yeah. It, it, you notice there's three men in that. In the front is the emperor. That's the emperor, that would be the Byzantine emperor. He's in the middle there, and he's holding an orb in his hand. And if you look at it carefully, you will see that the orb has a cross above it, proving that he's a Christian. Okay, so he's a Christian. Then on both sides of him are two retainers. Can you see the two retainers? Yeah. Those are Byzantine retainers. All right? Hugely significant. 
So that is the drachma that was used all over the world at that time. On the back side, the coin on the right is the back side. So one is the front, the other is the back of the same coin. Front side, you have the emperor with two retainers, yeah. and they have an orb in their hands with a cross, proving that they are Christians, that they are Byzantines. The back side then has a pedestal with a Byzantine cross. That's the Byzantine cross. Again, the cross of Jesus Christ, proving that they're Christian. Hugely significant. Now, those coins were used both in the Byzantine world, which were really the financial capital, the financial power of its state. That's why they were the superpower, the financial superpower. And that's why anybody that wanted to trade with the Byzantine had to use those coins, the drachmas, with the clearly a Christian significance. Okay? Yep. Now I want you to show you the next set of coins, which are the Sufyani dirham. Sufyani dirham, which is slide number 13. Well, as she's bringing it up, you're going to see that it's very much the same coin. It looks pretty much just like the coins of the drachmas that we just looked at. However, there's something hugely different. And you're going to see this as soon as she gets it up there. When yeah. you look, and you can tell me when you have them up there so I can start talking yes. about it. Yes, it's up there, Jay. Okay. Now let's look at the second set of coins. Again, looks like the exact same coin, right? Until you look at it very carefully. Look at it very carefully. I see you're bringing it up larger. If you can just enlarge it so it covers the whole screen. Look at the left side, which is the front side. Notice that you still have a, looks, it should be an emperor, but it's no longer an emperor. It's a caliph. You notice he has a turban on his head. What's more, he has the orb, but the cross has been taken off. And can you see that? There's no cross above the orb. So this is distinctly a statement they're making here. This is the caliph, the Sufyani caliph, the who of the Sufyanis. They are the first family of what we know as the Umayyad caliphate. The caliphate, the Umayyad caliphate, comes to power in 661 uh, at the Battle of Sifin when they, when the, uh, when they, uh, Mu'awiyah, who is the first of the Umayyad caliphates, the first of the Sufyani family, he destroys uh, Ali at the Battle of Sifin, kills Ali takes over control, becomes the caliph, and he is the first beginning of the first supposedly Islamic empire. Am I correct? This is the beginning of the first great Islamic empire. Now, be careful, be careful. There, Muslims will say, no, there were four other caliphs that came before him. That's true. According to them, there are four other caliphs that come before him. Uh, you have Abu Bakr, who comes from 632 to 634. You have Umar, who comes from 634 to 644. You have Uthman, who reigned from 644 to 656. And then you have Ali, who reigned from 656 to 661. 661, Ali is killed. The four greatly guided caliphs are then destroyed, and the Sufyanis, who are a family within the Umayyad dynasty, take over power. So these coins are their coins. They introduce these coins. Notice how similar they are to the Drachmas. Yeah. They're almost exactly the same. Why would they do that, Hatun? They're just identifying themselves. True, true, yeah. They're identifying themselves. These are the new men on town, but ho yeah. hold on a minute. Are Muslims allowed to use images? Uh, if they follow Sahih Bukhari, no. Ah, so you're saying if they follow Sahih Bukhari. But I've been told that this is something that comes all the way time from Muhammad. It is Muhammad that would allow anybody to use images. Am I correct? And but, it's Sahih Bukhari who tells us this. But it looks like because Sahih Bukhari was put together in 870, so people in seven, 600 were not aware of what Muhammad said, if they are using images. Unless, of course, this was not a problem for Arabs. And more of that, let's then get back to why do they have those images of the caliph, which would be Mu'awiyah, and his two retainers on the coin? Why are those images up there? There are two reasons. One is what you've already intimated, Back there in the 7th century, they didn't have TV, they didn't have newspapers, they did not have any of the media outlets that we use today. They didn't have internet or anything else to pretty much tell the world who they are. They had to use coins. Coins were the means by which you now announce that you are now in power. You announce yourself and what you do is you put your image on your coin to announce who you are. 
But if you are the new people in town, if you are the new ones, and in order for you then to be able to trade with your partners, your Byzantines and the Sassanids, because you have to have trade with the Byzantines because they're the big superpower, you're going to have to use coins that are similar to what they already know. And that's why the dirham is created. It's created by the Umayyads, the Sufyani family, to be able to trade with the Byzantines. So they have to use a coin that looks very similar. And that's why they look so similar, these two coins. But in order for them to make sure that they show who they are, they're very clearly not Christians. They don't want to be in, uh, identified as Christians. So that's why when they introduce their image of their caliph, they take off the cross from the orb, right? So yeah. no, these are cannot you cannot mistake the fact that they're Christians. Are you okay? Yeah. Okay, I just, so you cannot I just, mistake. The, I just put the two pictures together so that people can see people can see them like next to each other. So three men Good. are together. So you can see that their uh, head and also their um, yeah. So the crown is taken off the emperor and yeah. the uh, a uh, what do you call it the Turban. the topi is put on to the caliphs. There's the change there, and then the and the orb is exactly the same. Everything else is exactly the same, so that they're basically using the same coinage, so that people can still trade back and forth. Except that the cross is taken off the orb, and then on the back side, look at the back side. Now look at that. Look at the Sufyani one real carefully, and take a look and see what you see. You still see the pedestal there. And you still see the pole sticking straight up. Yeah. But the cross piece has been taken off. So there's no longer a cross. That's hugely important. You can see that there was a cross there. There's no longer the Byzantine cross. They've taken the cross piece off. So no one can mistake that this is a cross or a crucifixion or a person of Jesus on the cross. That's why they are now, they have to have the same coin. They have to have something that looks pretty much like it. But they take off the cross piece. That's in 661. That's why the date is hugely significant. So from 661 then, these coins are used. They don't call it the drachma, they give their own name. And the, dra the dirham is the equivalent to the drachma as far as currency is concerned. It's the Arab name for drachma. It's the Arab dirham. Hold that. I'm going to come back to that later on I'm, about something else I'm going to say. But let's take that under our, our belt and just to understand that, okay? So that's introduced in 661. The Umayyads are the ones who, where do they live? They will live way up in Damascus, so their trade is with the Byzantines. They've already destroyed now the Sassanid Empire. They now control the Sassanid Empire. They are now moving up. They have already moved. They're starting to move across North Africa. They're starting to move towards Andalusia, which is Spain today. And their biggest partners in trade would be the Byzantines. But they're not going any further north because the Byzantines are too powerful. They're also going east. They've already taken over and destroyed the Sassanids. And they're moving east. And they're going to finally move all the way, all the way up to the east, all the way over towards, uh, towards India. Or in your case, this way, all the way towards India. So from Andalusia, I'm sorry, this way, so from Andalusia, Spain, up to India over here, that's that whole swath of land that they're going to be controlling, which means they also control the trade. That's why they need their images. That's why they need their coins. That's why they need to show who they are. Now, if they are truly Muslims, why wouldn't they have Muhammad's image there? Our Since image is the problem. Go ahead. Or name of Allah. Or even the name of Allah. Or the Shahada. There's only one God but God. Yeah. Why don't they have that? Why do they have images when we know that no Muslim is allowed to have any image? This isn't idolatry. That's why Muslims, even today, they destroy any image. When you go to Turkey, uh, your country, when you go to Turkey and you look at all of the churches there, if you look at many of the churches, in fact, we even saw this there on the in the British Museum, we showed one terracotta that was from Turkey, a beautiful terra, beautiful mosaic, and all the faces had been scratched out. Yeah. All the faces had been scratched out, and you can see this all over Turkey. And I've been to Turkey. I have seen this in almost all the churches in almost where we have a picture of Jesus Christ. His face is scratched out. We have a picture of the the uh, the apostles. Their faces are scratched out. Even the birds. Remember, the birds faces were scratched out. And the one we looked at. Oh, well, you can't do much about it, Jay. If heavenly beings, angels are afraid of the pictures. 
Well, then why people, weren't they afraid of the have pictures? To, in people have to get rid of the faces. But as I then, said, in the 7th century, probably people who were more close to Muhammad, as they did, they were not aware of it since uh, uh, Bukhari came approximately 250 years after Muhammad. I would say it's earlier than Bukhari. I would say that this is something that was introduced quite a bit earlier. But let, hold on a minute. We'll, sit, we'll get to that, okay? Nonetheless, we know then by 661, there is no reference to Muhammad. There is no image of Muhammad. There's just this retainers, uh, these caliphal retainers, in this case, Mu'awiyah, introduced in 661. And then if you look at the numismatic, numismatic section of the British Museum, you will see in the numismatic section that all the coins for every one of the caliphs that come after to have the image of that caliph. All right? Yeah. Up until 680, when Marwan, Marwan is from a different family within the Umayyad Caliphate, he then takes over, destroys the Sufyanis, and takes over the Caliphate. His image is on his coin. And then his son, Abdul Malik. Now, Abdul Malik is enormously significant because Abdul Malik then comes to power in 685. His father dies, he takes over power. Five years, uh, Marwan only let rule for five years. He dies in 685. Abdul Malik comes to power. And what does he do? Well, like every other caliph before him, he mints his new coins. So let's look at those coins. Those are the second. This is the third set of coins I want to put up. And these are the coins. Uh, this is the coin with Abdul Malik's image on it. And he's, he has a huge big sword. So this is the coin that now shows that even Abdul Malik is falling into the same pattern of those that, pre uh, 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 that pre predecessed him. The predecessors all did the same thing. Why would not Abdul Malik do the same thing? And he does. So on the dirham that he coins and mints when he comes to power in 685, if you're going to put that, you can see it there. There it is. There is Abdul Malik on the left. That's the front side of the coin. And we can, the see, and the we can see Islam is the religion of peace. And then we can see big sword um, he's wearing on the coin. Now, why is that significant, Hatun? Because Islam is religion of peace, Jay. That's Just what... tongue cheek facetiously. You never can take anything Hatun says as face value. Uh, this is the this is her sense of humor, and this is okay. We understand it because we can see that she she's laughing at her jokes, and we love to laugh along with her. God bless you, Hatun. That's correct. So there you can see the big sword, the big man with the big sword, and that's him uh, introducing. He is now the new ruler. So that's six eighty five. Take a look at the backside. You notice it's exactly like all the predecessors. You can see the pedestal there. You can see the pole and the cross piece has been taken off, just like the ones from 661, six, uh, on up to six, seven, 670, 680, up until 685. So from 685 to 691, this is the coin that is now introduced for the dirham, which is there they use then to have trade with the Byzantines in the north who use, are using the drachmas. Am I correct? Yeah. Now, here's where the real, uh, the real um, mud hits the fan. Let's look at the next coin. And this is the one that they have on display there at the British Museum. Let's look at Abdul Malik's new coin. Because in 692, he introduces a completely new coin. So what happened, to, I, what happened to his sword, Jay? It's gone. His image is gone. The pedestal is gone. So the now, pole is gone. The cross piece Islam is gone. Islam become the religion of peace, thanks to Abdul Malik. So Abdul Malik now eradicates the images and he introduces this coin. This is in 692. Take a look at it. Now that one is on display there at the British Museum, but they didn't look at, they never made any significance. They, no one ever said, it. there's nothing written at the bottom to say why that is significant. Now, anybody who can read Arabic can see what that is. Look what's on the front side and look what's on the back side. But before we do, before we say what's on the front and the back side, let's back up a little bit. I want to back up and I help you understand why this is significant. To understand why this is significant, Hatun, we need to go back to 640s, 650s. If Muhammad died in 632, let's just take that on, uh, all right, let's don't sit there and try to dispute that. I would suggest that he didn't die in 632 because we do have references to him living even later than that. Nonetheless, 
by within 10 to 15 years, Abu Bakr and Umar had now moved out of have now moved out of the of just Damascus. And I'm sorry, um, uh, I'm sorry, of Medina. And they've now taken over Basra, Baghdad, Damascus, Jerusalem, and Cairo. So by 649, let's say 650, so within 20 years of Muhammad's death, the five great cities of the Levant are now under their control. Basra, Baghdad, which are today in Iraq, Damascus, which is in Syria, Jerusalem, which is in Israel, and Cairo, which is in Egypt. Those are the five great cities. They are the great cities of trade. They are the great cities of the Levant. They are the master loads. They have been taken over by these, these Arabs. These Arabs who are living way up in Damascus, much, much too far north. Why are they not living down in Medina? If this is what we've been told, that they're living in Medina. According to the Islamic traditions written by Al-Buhari and all the others, Ibn Isham writing about the biography, they're down, way down in Medina. They're not in Medina. Their empire's way up in Damascus. What's more, they're now moving out. And as they, especially Umar, from 634 to 644, he moves out right across North Africa. He is the one that really expands the empire. This continues on under Uthman, under Ali. And this continues on under the Sufyani family. By the time Abdul Malik comes to power now, in 685, from Spain to India is now under his control, which is the largest area of any empire of that time. This is by far the largest empire of that time. Spain to India, huge empire. But here's a problem. Here's a difficulty, Hatu. They are Arabs, but they don't have any identity. There is no Arab identity. There's nothing to show that they are unique. They have all this expanse of land. They have now just have really controlled the Byzantines, have destroyed the Sassanians, and now they control all of the Sassanid area. They control much of the Byzantine southern reaches of the Byzantine Empire. Well, that's all North Africa, all the way to Spain. They're going to start moving up into France. By 732, they're stopped there by at the Battle of Tours by Charles Martel. But before they do that, 685, now these Arabs have been in power for 40 years. Am I correct? Approximately, yeah. About 40 years, because now we're 685. Yeah, 630, from 632. 640s is when they make, took over the five migrator yeah. cities. Now they moved out, and now they have this huge swath of land. They are they see themselves in the uh, as a, a descendants of Abraham. They will always see themselves. That's one of the two of the names they give to themselves are Hagarines and Ishmaelites. Hagar, the, the slave of Sarah, who was given to Abraham to have Ishmael, her son, Ishmael, then is, and from his progeny are the Ishmael, Ishmaelites. And these Arabs call themselves Hagarines. They call themselves Ishmaelites. So they see themselves as cousins to the Byzantines and as cousin Christians and as cousins to the Jews up back to Abraham. Now, of course, the Jews and the Christians go through Isaac. The Arabs, who used to be the Nabataeans, go through Ishmael. Yeah. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. The Arabs don't have any prophetic line. The Jews and Christians do. All the prophets come in the line of Isaac. No prophet comes in the line of Ishmael, right? Yeah, according to... Yeah. The Jews and the Christians have a scripture. The Arabs have no scripture. They are the unscriptured people. This is in six, chapter 62, verse 2 of the Quran, in chapter 7, verse 157 of the Quran, which is interesting because umiyun, the word umiyun, if you ask al-fadi or anybody knows Arabic, umiyun does not mean illiterate, it means unscriptured. It is a better translation for umiyun is unscriptured. These are the unscriptured people. These are the ones who don't have a prophetic line. They don't have an identity like the Christians and Jews. And yet the Christians and Jews are the ones that they're, that they're battling with. They're the ones that are in competition with. They are in Jerusalem. They have their headquarters in Jerusalem. Though they're up in Constantinople, their sanctuary, the, the, uh, the Church of the Sepulchre, is down in Jerusalem. And their pilgrimage is always down to Jerusalem from all over the Byzantine world. You see the difficulty? 
How are you going to create this identity? How are you going to create your own scripture? And how are you going to create your own prophet? How are you going to get your own prophetic line? And how are you going to then have a revelation that is uniquely yours? Well, this is a problem that Abdul Malik has. And remember, Abdul Malik is the greatest of the Umayyad Caliphates. He is the greatest of the Caliphs. He is now at the height of the, uh, this is the height of the Umayyad Caliphates. This is the, where they're at the strongest. This is the where they have the most amount of land. This is where they are at their most wealthy. And he wants to create this identity. So what do you do in order to create that identity? Well, the first thing you do is you go to where the Byzantines have their sanctuary and you build a large building and you slap it right back, slap back in the middle of Jerusalem, known as the Dome of the Rock. And he does that in 691. He puts then builds that enormous structure there in 691. Now, Take a look and see where it's situated. It's up on the hill overlooking it to down towards the Church of the Sepulchre, which is where the pilgrimages that the Byzantines come to. The Christians all came there. And of course, the Jews see it as their holy city. So both the Jews and Christians look at Jerusalem as their holy city. But you're not living in Jerusalem. You're living way up in Damascus. That's why Abdul Malik builds this building. It's the largest building of its day. It's the largest structure of its day. It's a statement. It's a very powerful statement saying, we are the new people on the block. We are the new, basically, we are the, now in charge of everybody. And more than that, you do something in that building. First of all and foremost, we now know from looking at Dan Gibson's material that, that we've already discussed uh, before, that that building is not facing Mecca. That's significant. It's facing what? Um, it's between um, Petra and Jerusalem. No, it's facing directly to Petra. Are you talking about this? I think it's uh, between Petra and Jerusalem. It's not. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. Okay. Take a look okay. and go look at Dan Gibson's pictures again. The Dome of the Rock, the entire citadel, citadel, the Dome of the Chain. Remember the Dome of the Chain? Remember that one that's next to it? That small mosque that's next to it? Yeah. Remember, the Dome of the Chain is a mosque. The Dome of the Rock is not a mosque. Remember the, high, the high live stream that you had with uh, David, Dan Gibson about two weeks ago? Yes, I'm just trying to find my picture, Jay. Remember, he said this. He was very clear on this. And this is something that most people didn't pick up on. You need to pick up on these things. And those of you who listened to that, what Hutton did two weeks ago with Dan Gibson was enormously significant. Go and look at that video again. It's there on DCCI. It's Dan Gibson. And what Dan Gibson did in just about an hour and a half, he brought out some brand new material that I even haven't heard of before. And one of them is this what he's talking about. Look at the Dome of the Rock and you will see the entire citadel, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is there in the south co corner, the south wall of the Dome of the Rock. All that citadel, the Dome of the Rock and the Dome of the Chain, which is a little mosque that sits right next to it on the right side of it. They are all facing directly towards Petra, not in between. They're facing towards Petra. Can't be in between Jerusalem because they're in Jerusalem. So they're facing directly towards Petra. Hugely significant because for the Umayyads, Petra was their sanctuary. Petra has always been their sanctuary for the Umayyads. Remember for the Umayyads. So that's the first thing he does. He builds this enormous building. What's interesting, he uses Christian architects to not only design it, but then Christian workers to build it. Almost like he's thumbing his nose at Christianity. Enormous building. You can still see it today. When you go to Jerusalem, it stands out with that beautiful golden dome. Are you still looking for a picture? Yeah, I've got, yeah, I find the pictures. Oh, sorry, that's Damascus. Okay. I'll keep talking while you, while you look for the yeah, picture. Yeah, sorry. I'll keep talking. So here they built this beautiful building. Now, if you want a picture, I, I don't have it on the PowerPoint that I sent you because I only give, if you want to look at it, in fact, no, no, if you go I, up to I do have slide, them. I do have them. I've got like slide number five on the PowerPoint that I sent you. Look at slide number five. I've got it right there. I do have them, but in that slide, I've got like 281, 281 um, pictures. So that it was, okay. Uh, yeah. Five of the PowerPoint that I sent last night. Anyhow, let's keep going. So when you look at that, when you look at the Dome of the Rock, when you look at Alexa Mosque, and when you look at the Dome of the Chain, all three of them, in fact, the entire citadel there in Jerusalem, all three of them are facing directly towards Petra. 
And that's hugely significant. But the dome of the train chain is, is it helps us. That just helps us to know where the Qibla is. That's the Qibla we're talking about. So you build this enormous structure and then you build. Now, remember, that structure has been destroyed and rebuilt 11 times. So we don't have the original part of that building except for the two ambulatories. Now, can you go up to that slide that I have of the ambulatories on my PowerPoint that I gave you? Um, number I, seven and slide number eight. I don't know how to share the PowerPoints, Jay. Okay, that's all right. Okay, for those people who are able to go up on our on our power, if if you, and we'll have to do this another time when we actually do unpack this part of it. This is not really what we were planning to do. We weren't planning to do this part, so that's, don't don't worry about it. I'll just just explain. I'll explain it to this so people can understand. When you look at the Dome of the Rock, the only original part of the Dome of the Rock that still exists today are what we call the inner and outer ambulatories. These are the the circular octagonal arches that are that surround the rock itself and there's an inner one and there's an outer one and on those inner and outer ones those are the only part that were originally built in 691 by Abdel Malik now on those ambulatories are inscriptions written in Arabic and you need to look at those inscriptions there you go there there you've got it right there so you can see it now take a look at that if you look on the left side and look on the right there you see the two look where the two green arrows are pointing to those two green arrows are pointing to the inner and, ambla and outer ambulatory. Now let's go to the next slide after that. If you can oh, put the next slide up, just uh, hit it with your cursor. Because the next slide then shows those inscriptions. On those inscriptions, which is the only original part, on those inscriptions are, are Arabic. But what are they saying? Now, when you ask a Muslim why the Dome of the Rock is important, what its significance is, they'll say it is the third most holy shrine in Islam. And the reason why it's significant is because this is where Muhammad was woken up in the middle of the night. And he was told by the angel Gabriel to get on the back of the winged horse called the Burak. And he flew from Mecca. This is supposedly happened in 621 before he moved to uh, before he moved to Medina, he was still living in Mecca. He was told to get on the back of this winged horse called the Burak, and he flies from Mecca all the way up to Jerusalem. And then at Jerusalem, he then goes up to the seven heavens and meets Allah, and Allah tells him to pray 50 times a day. He comes down to the fifth heaven, uh, according to, this is known as the Miraj, and he comes down to the fifth heaven, and Ma Moses says, how many prayers did you do? And he says, I did 50. He says, no, get it down. So he bounces back and forth between the seventh and the fifth heaven and gets it down from 50 to 45 to 30 to 15, 10, down to five prayers. And Moses, okay, that's enough. Go on back down to earth. He comes back down to Jerusalem and flies on back down to Mecca. That is known as the Mitnash, and that's why the Dome of the Rock was built, according to what Muslims tell us today, according to Al-Buhari. Every Muslim that you ask today why was the Dome of the Rock rebuilt? It was built because of that event. The Miraj, Muhammad going up to the seven heavens, flying on the winged horse called the Burak. Look and see if any of these inscriptions talk about that. Do they, Hatun? No, they don't. They don't say a thing about the Burak. They don't say a thing about Muhammad going up to, the, to Jerusalem. They don't say a thing about going up to the seven heavens. They say nothing about Moses. Uh, to, or about the five prayers, none of this is in on those inscriptions. And those inscriptions were created in 691. Those inscriptions are Quranic. They are Quranic. But they say nothing about the, the Mirah. So what do they say? Well, let's take a look at them again. Look at them carefully. And you will see that there are Quranic verses. If you look at them, you will see, and I've got them on slide number nine, if you want to put slide number nine up. Slide number nine shows three of the major inscriptions that are up there. Chapter four, verse 171 of the Quran. O people of the scriptures, do not exaggerate in your religion, nor utter aught concerning Allah, save the truth. The Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, was only a messenger of Allah. This is slide number nine. There you go. And his word, which he conveyed unto Mary, and a spirit from him, so believe in Allah and his messengers, and say not three, cease. It is better for you, Allah is only one God. Far is it removed from his transcendent message, majesty that he should have a son. So here you have chapter 4, verse 171. 
That's nothing about the Miraz. That's nothing about Muhammad going up to the seven heavens. There's nothing about the Burak there. There's nothing about Allah or Moses conferring or anything about five prayers. It's all attacking Jesus Christ, is it not? It's attacking the Trinity. It's attacking Jesus' divinity. It's attacking also his sonship. I think this is where Muslims learn soon after you question Islam. They attack Christian faith because that's what their early leaders do. They can't defend Islam. They can't explain Islam. So what do they do? They attack Christian faith. And this is the historical evidence for that. And from the very beginning, if this is the earliest Quranic material we can find, 691, now, there, I'm sure there are Muslims who are listening right now, and there are people who are listening say, hold on a minute, there are much earlier than 691. No, they're not. We're now showing and we're now proving that the earliest manuscript, the earliest fragments come much later. But what we do know is that this is the earliest dated fragment. This is the earliest Quranic because we can date it. Because this is the great thing about, the, about buildings. Whenever you have inscriptions on buildings, we know when the buildings were built. This was built in 691. Interestingly, this is attacking Jesus, his divinity, the Trinity, and his sonship. Then you get chapter 17, verse 111. Praise be to God, who hath not taken unto himself a son, and who hath no partner in the sovereignty, nor hath he any protecting friend through dependence. Who is that attacking again? Christian faith. It's attacking Jesus Christ. It's attacking his sonship, and it's attacking the fact that he hath no partners. That is attacking the what we know as shirk that Jesus God, Jesus cannot be God because God has no partners. That's from chapter 5, also 70, uh, chapter 5, verse 72. It says that as well. Let's go to the next one. And here's where the whole, this is the probably the most important one. This is Surah 112. Hold on to that. Huge and significant. What does Surah 112 say? There is no God but God. He is one. He has no associate. Who is that attacking? He has no associate. Jesus again. Say he is God, the one God, the eternally besought of all. He begetteth not, nor was he begotten. Who is that attacking again? John 3, 16. Yep. Jesus, the begotten son of God. Again, his son, sonship. God cannot have his son. He does not begetteth. That's attacking the Bible, specifically John 3, 16. And there is none comparable unto him. And now look what it says next. Muhammad is the messenger of God. This is the first time we see Muhammad's name introduced on any inscription. And it's introduced at the Dome of the Rock in 691. So take, just let take a me look just, at these. Three. Just let me make a point, Jay. So not only one of their earliest writings is attacking Christian faith, Christian core doctrine, since Islam and Muhammad is undefendable, as the last part you read, Surah 112, can I just express that in the Quranic version of Surah 112, Muhammad is the messenger of God is not there. Just make sure like people are aware of it. Okay. And notice what's the beginning of Surah 112. Look there on the, uh, on the Dome of the Rock. No. There is no God but God. He is one. Where is Muhammad as a messenger of God right after that? Hmm, God knows. So the shahada is not complete there. Have you noticed that? Yeah, yeah. Even on the Iraq, they have not made a complete shahada. But the shahada, la ilai illallah, Muhammadur Rasulallah. That's the shahada. La ilai illallah. La ilai illallah. That means there is only one God but God. Muhammadur Rasulallah, then Muhammad is his messenger or his, his prophet, has to be part of the shahada. The shahada is not complete there. This is an incomplete shahada. It's introduced on the Dome of the Rock. And what's fascinating to me, this is the problem with the Quran. You will not find the shahada as a complete form anywhere in the Quran. So we've got um, the part where it says, say he's God, which is a kulufallah, you had Allah samad part. That is Surah 112. It is finishes, like Muhammad is his messenger, it is not part of Surah 112. And the That's beginning right. part that there is no God but God, he is one, he has no association. That's not part of Surah 112 either. 
So this is all material that has been introduced by the Dome of the Rock, which is not paralleled in the Quran. Can you then see that this pre predates the Quran, yet it is introduce introducing, because what's fascinating is look and see what happens after these inscriptions are put up. Okay? Now, when these inscriptions are put up on the Dome of the Rock, 691, what else does Abdul Malik do? Well, to understand that, you need to go back to another researcher. His name is Yehuda Nebo. And Yehuda Nebo is a researcher at the University of Jerusalem, has done the germinal work on looking at all the inscriptions. And when you look at all the inscriptions uh, from the Arab inscriptions, these are, he did this, he's probably the only one that's done this kind of germinal work. And he dipped from 650s, 60s, 670s, all the way up until the 680s. And he looked at what they call the Caliphal Protocols. And the Caliphal Protocols are the official documents for the caliphs, the, the rulers, uh, the Arab rulers at that time. And what he noticed when he looked at all of these protocols, these official documents of the caliphs, there were no reference to Muhammad in any of these caliphal protocols. There was no reference to any people called Muslims in any of these caliphal protocols, though they should be Muslims, because these are all protocols from the Sufyani Umayyad period up until the Marwan Umayyad period. So these are all Umayyad caliphs. These are all Umayyad caliphs from 661 on up. There's no reference to a book called the Quran. There's no re reference to any religion called Islam. There's no reference to any city called Mecca in any of these protocols. What's more, when he looked at the Bismillah al-Rahman al-Rahim, when he looked at that, it's not the same Bismillah that we have, that we use today in Islam. This he noticed all the way up until 691. And when he got to the Caliphal Protocols in 691, the protocols written by Abdul Malik in 691, suddenly, overnight, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah is introduced. The Shahada is introduced into that protocol. That's the first time we see it. Bismillah al-Rahman al-Rahim is introduced. The Bismillah, as we see in the Quran today, is introduced uh, on those protocols. So here you have Abdul Malik introducing it on the, uh, on the Dome of the Rock. He then introduces it also on the protocols in the same year, in 691. He's introducing his prophet. He's denigrating the Christian's God, Jesus, confronts the Trinity, confronts Jesus' divinity, confronts his sonship, and confronts his begottenness. And while he confronts that, he then introduces his man, Muhammad, the messenger of God, on the Dome of the Rock. You're right. It's not in Surah 112 in the Quran. That's a whole nother story. That's a whole nother problem that we're going to get into in another, in another live stream. Why is it the Quran does not, it does not have the same, the same verses that we see on the Dome of the Rock? We'll get into that at another time. What's also interesting is, now that he's got it on the building, he's now got it in the protocols, what does he do next? Now we come back to the coins. And that's why in 692 then, he introduces that new coin, the coin that you put up earlier. And that's um, the coin that Abdul Malik introduces in 692, if you could put that up. Okay, um, just a moment, Jay. I just find my picture um, regarding the... Alaska Mosque. Do you still want to see it? Yes, you are correct. I was wrong. About the dome of the chain? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You don't need to look. Just be where I was wrong. You were correct. Um, okay, so that, that they're all facing Petra. That's what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, what, okay, did, now let's what did you want to see? Now I want to go back to slide number 15. Um, which is the, the slide of Abdul Malik, 692 afterwards. This is where the Shahada is introduced, in 692. Yeah. Okay, you got it up there? Yeah. Okay, that's the slide I want you to look at. And I'll take a look at those coins. On the front side, you will see the Shahada. There's the Shahada. If anybody speaks Arabic, you can see that's the Shahada. La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. So there is, there is only one God but God and that Muhammad is his messenger. That's on the front side. What's on the back side? Do you know what's on the back side? Well, I've got it there on, if you look on the slide, oh, you didn't put the whole slide up. On the reverse side, first of all, 
they've taken off the cross, right? They've taken off the yeah. pedestal. On the front side, they've taken off Abdul Malik's. He has taken off his image. No more images. That's why I'm suggesting that maybe this problem with iconoclasm was introduced by Abdul Malik. I don't know. All we know is that he's no longer used images and none of the caliphs used images after that. So let All of it went to script. I'm just putting it went them, to script. I'm just trying to put them together so people can kind of compare them. If you could put up the whole slide number 16 and just put it on, that's that kind of has the whole story right there. Slide number 16 has everything in on one slide. Okay, I see you putting up the Malik's image first. That's the front side, and there you can see the pedestal of the Byzantine cross, then you can see the pole from the Byzantine cross, but no cross piece. And then you can see Abdul Malik, uh, and then you can see what Abdul Malik has done next. He's taken off his image and he's put up the Shahada. And he's taken off the pedestal. On the back side is Surah 112. Here is Surah 112, where Muhammad is introduced. God has no, he, he is against, there is no, he does not beget, nor is he begotten. And Muhammad is the prophet of God. So it confronts the person of Jesus Christ, the God of Christianity, and it introduces their prophet. So here you can see, this is a, this is a concerted effort by Abdul Malik to not only bring Arabic as the lingua franca for the whole region, but to then take off the images and introduce the Shahada. There's only one God but God. Muhammad is his prophet. And then you have Surah 112, where there is now God, where he attacks the, 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 uh, the sonship of Jesus Christ. He is not begotten, nor is begotten, nor is begetteth. And Muhammad is the messenger of God, introducing those two uh, pieces, which are both found on the Dome of the Rock. Not in the same sequence. So this is a year later. So what's Abdul Malik doing? He is now introducing his prophet. But in order to have a prophet, then you need to have a book. Am I correct? Yeah, and then we get the Quran. Well, we don't get the Quran right away. Uh, you would think we would get the Quran right away. But then we get all kinds of fragments. And we get all kinds of different manuscripts and different fragments. And we're going to get into that in another live stream because this is a whole new problem when you look at the Quran because the Quran is not at one point. Uh, when we look at the Sana'a manuscript, you and I did this earlier. Look at the Sana'a manuscript, which is the earliest manuscript that is, and again, it's only it's only 19% of the Quran, 19 to 22% of the Quran. It's a very small portion of the Quran, and it is dated to 705, the upper layer. But remember, it's a palimpsest. There's a lower layer, and the lower layer has 70 verses Sorry, has 60, 63. 63 verses with 70 differences, 70 variants from within those 63 verses. And that is not the same Quran that is on the upper layer. Now, most scholars were still doing an awful lot of work. Uh, some scholars want to date the lower layer to the time of Uthman, where I, I would suggest you better be careful about, uh, about, you can't date ink. So I don't know how they came to that conclusion. Uh, but they do know that the upper layer would be around 705, the beginning of the 8th century. The lower layer is probably, I would say it's probably within the first two dec last two decades of the 7th century. So by, around the time of Abdul Malik. That would be the beginning of the Quran. Because once you have the man, then you've got to have a book. And you can see that's where you start to see the Quran being put together. But even as they're putting it together, they're not, they're not in any way are the, is it the Quran that we have today. Because then all of a sudden there's a proliferation of Qurans. And this happens uh, uh, after his son, Abdul Malik, uh, Al-Walid, sorry, Al-Walid, Abdul Malik's son, Al-Walid, comes to power in 705. And he rules from 705 to 715. And you start seeing a proliferation of Qurans. And that's why, uh, and, you know, bless their hearts, the Muslims on Islamic Awareness website have put up uh, 63 different fragments that they claim are before 719. Remember that we remember we confronted that uh, at, at the um, at Speaker's Corner back in September. Remember when we did that? Yeah. And we looked at 63 fragments. Um, I'm not I'm not uh, ready to divulge what we now know about those 63 fragments. I don't say any more than that. But we pretty much have uh, we pretty much can confront that notion that any of them are before 719. That's all I can say right now because that's a whole nother area of study that I'm going to be introducing in the next few weeks. So, but can you see? Let me go ahead. Let me just kind of try to put those coins together. Um, 
there is no coin as representative of Islam from the time of Muhammad. Even though Muhammad conquered and took the life of other people and take their land, there is no coin regarding um, Islam, co core of Islam, from time of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman. By the time of Uthman, Islam yes, was already in Azerbaijan um, and in north of North Africa and uh, what is that other country? Spain part of the world. Andalusia. Still, we don't have any coin represents Islam fully. And then we've got this guy, this guy called Abdul Malik. We first see his coin with his sword, which shows Islam is the religion of peace. And then soon after that, images is all gone. Suddenly, we've got Shahada plus Surah 112. Okay, may I back up and just say two things? Yep. It stands to reason, and Muslims will come back to you, and they have a right to say this. It stands to reason that when Islam was first beginning, they would not have coins because they really didn't have an infrastructure then. They were still conquering. And as a result, and you know this happens with any with any large conquer, conquests. Conquests do not have coins to begin with. So they have to use the coins that existed. So they would have used drachmas. However, you cannot say this after 661. Because by 661, the first Arab coins are introduced. Those are the ones we showed. If you put up slide number 16, just put up the whole slide there like you did earlier. Put up the PowerPoint and put up that slide. Everything is in sequence right there on slide 16. Because there you will see, Hatun, that you've got the, you've got the Arabs finally introducing their coins by 661. Which would make sense because they've been in power now for about 20 years. And they have now outstretched. They now need to have a coin to represent them. They've been using drachmas earlier than that. But if this is the first coin that they're introducing, why in the world don't they have Muhammad's image on it? Since they don't have a problem with image at this time. So I would, so I would say you are being very generous because Muslims have a time to take people slaves. Muslims have a time to rape women in front of their husbands. Muslim have a time to get rid of the um, other people of other faith, yet they didn't have time to put together their own coin. Well, I cannot. I'm not going to argue with you. That is true. That we, but we we are arguing from an argument of silence. What is interesting is with the Sufyani coins in 661, there's no longer any silence because now we have coins to show that these are the first Arabs. These are the first Arab coins we can find. And what do they show? That's what's disturbing. So this is not an argument of science anymore. Now we're arguing from an argument, uh, uh, an argument of historicity because the coins, you can see them. They're right there. Look at them on the upper left-hand side. Sorry, the bottom left-hand side. The bottom left-hand side, when you look at them, those are the Sufyani coins. They're introduced in 661. Very similar to the coins right above them, which are the Byzantine dinar early to mid 7th century, up until 661. 661, no longer can Muslims say, ah, yeah, but we don't, we didn't have coinage at this time. Yes, you do. You have coins. Take a look at them. And there are images and you have the back beside a half of a Byzantine cross. Then let's go to the upper right hand corner and you will see there is the first coins by Abdul Malik introduced in 685 when he comes to power to show that he's now in power. And those coins have a sword. You're right. He's there's his image. He's all by himself. He doesn't have any retainers. He just wants himself to be there because he was a very powerful man. And this is well known about Abdul Malik. He is known as the great Arab reformer. What does he do? He then introduced the Arabic language as the international language. And what does he most significantly do? He builds the Dome of the Rock, changes the protocols, and then in si that's done in 691. And then in 692, he then introduces those coins. And those are the coins that are hugely significant. The British Museum did not pay attention to this very very quickly. They didn't even understand this. And I don't think anybody in the British Museum knows what we know. And this is why there needs to be a critical assessment of how Islam began. If you just want to follow the coins, you can see that there's a problem here. 
Because I can understand that the Muslims will say, well, that's an argument of silence. Of course, we didn't have coins that early, but you do have coins by 661. And Abdul Malik's coins are well are well documented there, and they're right there in the British Museum. We've got them up there on the slide right now. And what look and see what he does in 692. He takes a, uh, he introduces the Shahada, and he introduces Muhammad, and he introduces an attack against the begot the Son of God, the Jesus as Son of God. So this is very significant. When you look at not only a theological battle that's going on, the political battle that's going on, the political battle that the Umayyads are doing with Abdul Malik, that's why he builds the Dome of the Rock right there in Jerusalem above the Church of the Sepulchre. And that's why from then on out, the, the, once you have the prophet, then he has to start. He has to start, of course, creating a, a revelation. And that's the problem of the revelation. Now, I want to do one more thing before we move on. Are we ready to move on or are we going to still... You want to un unpack any more of this? Uh, we can move on. Can you go to slide number 18 and put that up? I'm not sure if I'm happy for you to move me around with the slides, Jay. It's right there. You've got it already up but, there. Just go down to 18 now and just put that one up I'm there. Just, I'm just very generous today. <laughs> okay. You're being, I, I know I'm causing you an awful lot of hassle and an awful lot of problems, but if you can go up to slide number 18, I want to bring up one more problem because this is yeah. something that I think is hugely significant. Now, that's slide number 16. I want number 18. No, that's 18. That's that right there. Take a look at that. I see Bart Carnley. Surely Muhammad or Allah isn't mentioned you know, until after 691. Oh, I that's can't, correct. Um, sorry, I can't get rid of that now. Um, but you are able to see the slide? And people see that slide number 18? Yeah. Mark Carnley's comment is in the is in front of it, but that's okay. Uh, we can still see the bottom of it. I want you to look at that. That I want you to look at that uh, slide there. Remember, the dirham is introduced in 661, right? We've already covered that. There was no dirham before 661. Am I correct on that? Yes. And the only reason, the reason why there's no dirham before 661 is there's no need for a dirham before 661 because the drachmas were used, the Byzantine drachma and earlier the Sassanian drachma. They just used whatever coins they had to hand. They were not a strong enough empire. The empire, the Umayyad Caliphate, really created an empire and was able to then control the commerce by 661 with the Sufyani family. That's why the dirham then became the equivalent to the drachma. The dirham would be the Arab equivalent. And they introduce their own coins with their images on it. Okay, am I correct? Yeah, like so. This uh, is the this is what we are on. putting from the um, history history what we have. Okay, now I want you to open up to chapter twelve, verse twenty of the Quran. Take out your Quran and read Surah twelve, verse twenty. I didn't hear the please, but I will read it. You, want, you go ahead and read it. Chapter 12, verse 20. This is the story of Joseph. Chapter 12 is all about Joseph. He's been sold by his brothers, right, to the Egyptians. Look and see what verse 20 it says. And they sold him for a reduced price, a few drums, and they were concer concerning him of okay. those content with the little. Okay, so they sold them for what? How many? What did they sell them for? A few what? A few drums. Dirhams? Yeah. Okay, right there. Is there a problem with that? Oh, well, Joseph is around 1800 BC, and the drums we looked at 661. Uh, I don't know, like there is huge timeline between them, Jay. That's the first problem. There would be no dirhams at the time of Joseph. Okay, well, that's not a that's not a big problem. Uh, we can just say that they were trying to contextualize. They're trying to use a coin that existed at the time when Muhammad was writing. No, so that's why he used the dirham. No, excuse me. That wouldn't work, Jay, because this is all wise and all knowing. Allah is talking. Did Allah forget what he did to um, Joseph? Okay, a few dirham counted out. What do you do with count it? What does count it out mean? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. They're coins. That means yeah. you count out coins, right? Yeah. Were there any coins in existence in 1800 BC? No. I would say no. 
No coins existed in 1800 BC. Coins had not yet been invented. The coins were, coins were invented by the Lydians in the 600 BC. That's 1200 years later. So are you trying to tell me Allah got two things wrong? Not only there, what Allah and, sold for Joseph and Allah forget to give us the right accountability thing. Absolutely. This shows me that whoever wrote the Quran did not know what was going on at the time of Joseph in 1800 BC. Obviously, there were no coins that early. So you can't be counting out coins. You can't be counting out anything. Coins were yet to be, any coins anywhere in the world had yet to be invented. Those were only invented by the Lydians. The first ones to ever use coins were, were by, uh, by Lydians. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, wait. What about the Bible? Does the Bible make this mistake? Shekels? Open up the Bible to Genesis chapter 37, verse 28. Um, Let's see what the Bible does. Same story. Genesis. Are you able to find it? My Bible is not with me, sorry. Oh, you have a Quran, but you don't have a Bible. No, because I, okay, well, I came from Okay, I've got somewhere. Genesis chapter 37, verse 28. Let me read it to you. This is the story of Joseph being sold by his brothers to the Midianites. Not the Egyptians, the Midianites. Interestingly, the Bible gets the right people. Egyptians would have not been where the Joseph was or his brothers were. So that's interesting. So not only does it got the Egyptians wrong, it was the Midianites. The Midianites are just to the west of the Nabataean era. They are over what is to, in the, today in the Negev, the Negev desert of Israel. That's where the Midianites come from. That's where Joseph was being sold, to the Midianites, not the Egyptians. The Bible gets the right people. The Quran gets the wrong people. Let's continue on. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. The Midianites are the Ishmaelites. Ooh, two, 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 two. 20 shekels. Now you might say, hold on a minute. Aha, the Bible's got the same problem. 20 shekels, that's a coin. No, it is not. A shekel is not a coin. A shekel is a weighted measure. 20 shekels is equivalent to 0.2 kilograms of silver. Hold on a minute. It even gets better than that, Hatu. Not only does the Bible get the right currency, get the right people, it gets the right price for a slave in 1800 BC because of the Nuzi tablets and because of the Mari tablets that we have now discovered of which are part of our museum tour that we have in the British Museum. Because when you look at the price of a slave in the 1800 BC, the end of the, the beginning of the second millennia, the price of a slave is around 0.2 kilograms of a silver, which means not only does the Bible get the right currency, it gets the right price of the slave. Ooh, I love my Bible. And we've not even asked the Bible to be correct on that. So can you see in this case, now remember, Moses, who wrote the books of Moses, was not living in 1800 B.C. He would not have known about the price of slaves in 1800 B.C. How did Moses get the right price of slave? How did he get the right currency? And how is it that we not only do we get the right currency, this is not a coin. These are not coins. The shekels were weighted measure. That's how they traded back in those days. They used weighted measures. They used weighted measures of silver, weighted measures of gold, weighted measures of precious stones. And that's why not only has the Bible got the right name, it's got the right denomination, and it's got the right price. That's why my Bible is so historically accurate. The Quran, however, is not. The Quran has got a coin, and in fact that it's even mentioning a coin is a problem in and of itself. The fact that it's got the wrong people that the, that, uh, that the brothers are selling Joseph to. But it gets even better than that. You want to, Here's where the counting, and this is what really gets me excited. Are you ready? Yeah. Who is writing, supposedly, who is writing, or who is receiving the Quran? Who is the one that receives the Quran? Muhammad. So this verse would have been in existence while Muhammad was living, right? Yes. And would have been completed before Muhammad died, am I correct? Yeah. And Muhammad died in 632, am I correct? Yeah, and drums were 661. Ah! Dirhams didn't even exist in 632! So even if he had wanted to contextualize it, even if he was trying to use a coin to the people to understand at that time, it would have made no sense to have the word didham, which is in the Arabic, there in chapter 12, verse 20, in a book that was finished in 632, when Muhammad died. If, of course, the book was finished in 632. 
which means chapter 12, verse 20, had to be written after 661. Am I correct? Yeah, just let me just make a comment. Someone was asking if the word teram has been used in Surah 12, verse 20. I'm looking at the Arabic word by word. Uh, Darahima, which has been translated as drums, yes, it has been used in Arabic. And it has been translated as drum as well. I'm going to show it. I'm going to point to it. It's right there where my finger is at. There's the Darama. Can you see it in the Arabic? Those who can read Arabic. They can't That's see. The Darama, where okay. my finger is pointing. Darhama, right there. I've underlined it with green. I'll put it as big as I can make it. Can you see in the Arabic? I'm going to hold it as steady as I can. That's the Arabic. For anybody that can read Arabic, you will see the word Dharma is in the Arabic. Now, I am aware of the fact that Muslims are going to have a problem with this. And every time I brought this up, Muslims don't know how to answer this. There were no Dharmas prior to 661. There were drachmas, but the drachma is not an Arabic word. Dirham is an Arabic word. The dirham is what is supposedly what was there when Muhammad, before Muhammad died. Oh, even more than that, the dirham would be the eternal word of God, right? So the dirham should have also been there in the eternal tablets. Are you showing the dharma there? Yeah. Can you just point to it? Um, I'm just looking. I can't point, I don't know how to point it, but like it's, you can see it's on the fourth. It's the second one, don't just, it's the third one down from the top. Yeah. Dharma. Can you all see it there? Dharma. You start from the right, the da, the ra, the him, and the meme. Starting from the right, going to the left. There is the fata, the, 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 the and then you can see the fata and the three fatas on Dharma. And there's the sukun for the dr. So that's where you can see that that is the word. The word is in Arabic. You cannot take it out. You cannot change it, which means that this could not have been written while Muhammad was living, proving once again that the Quran must have been a much later uh, edition. It had to have been written after 661 in order to have that word in there. It, let me just give you an example. If I, in 1960, I, I like your pair of glasses that you have on Hatun. I, I, I like to buy those pair of glasses or I'd like to sell it to you. Um, let's say back in 1960, you want, I wanted to sell that to you for 200 euros. Would that make any sense if I were to write that I wanted to sell that to you for 200 euros in 1960? First of all, I need to be alive in 1960. Secondly, do they, did they have like euros in those times? And that there much no, euro was, was like too much money, I guess. So if I wrote a story about us back in the 1960s and I buy a pair of glasses for you for for 200 euros, anybody who reads that will say, scratch it and say, hold on a minute. How could Jay have sold Hutton and her glasses for 200 euros in 1960 when those were not, there were no euros around at that time. That's too early. This is the same problem. You can't have, first and of I all. I wasn't around as well. It's not only euros. I wasn't around as well. Okay, well, that I'm sorry. I should have used a date a little bit later. But you were around when you well, I can't even remember when euros were finally invented. I think it was 70, 25 years ago. You're older than 25. When you were seven years old, the data, the euros were invented when Europe became an identity. European Union was inter introduced. So that's the problem with the didham. The didham could not have existed at the time of Joseph. It could not have existed at the time of Muhammad. It could have only existed after 661. Not only have they got the wrong denomination, they got the wrong currency, they got the wrong coinage. On top of that, they've got the wrong word. Oh, I love it. And that's why when I look at the Quran, I can see that this is a book that has been written much later and redacted back to Muhammad because this is just another case in point. This is a historical anachronism, a glaring historical anachronism. I hope that helps you with the coins. So someone is uh, making a comment. Why should... They believe in you since you are not even Muslim. Regarding the um, regarding the um, conversation we had coins as well as the uh, direction of the prayer, Jay. Please don't. And I, you could be right. We could be lying. We could be making this up as we go along. In fact, we've just wasted uh, about an hour and 15 minutes if we have. If you don't believe me, then go to the numismatic section and go and look at for yourself. Look and see. In fact, go to the British Museum 
and go to these two galleries and just look at what they get. Look at the dates they give to that coin. Look at the dates they give to the Sufiani coin. Look, and they, you'll see it's 661. I'm not making this up. We, You were right with me, were you not, Hatun? You saw the dates at the British Museum. The dates are correct. I'm not, I'm not disputing the dates. No one does dispute those dates because those coins were introduced. They have the dates on them. They don't call it 661. That's the, that's the Gregorian calendar. We look at, and they probably use the dates for that. Uh, the Sufyanis and the uh, Umayyads would have their own dating methods. But of course, no one disputes the fact that that's a six, the 661, which is the Gregorian calendar. That's the date that uh, that, that coin was introduced. No one, date, no one uh, disputes the fact that in six, uh, six, nine, 685, Abdul Malik's coin was introduced. That's not in dispute. And please, we could be lying. You're correct. And I, because of the fact I'm not a Muslim, this has nothing to do with Islam. Have you noticed? I'm sorry. It does. You don't have to be a Muslim or a Christian or anybody to make this discussion. This is a historical discussion. We're talking about objects. We're talking about artifacts that have dates on them, that have that have names on them, that have references to them. This is why it's important that you don't just sit there and say, I can't trust you because you're not a Muslim. It's the fact that Muslims have not done this homework. Show me one Muslim that has even looked at these coins. Give me a name. Show me any work that's been done on these coins by Muslims. And show me any Muslim that has even noticed that the dirham should not be in chapter 12, verse 20. Show me anybody that's written this. I wish Muslims would be self-critical. So I, I wish they would be as self-critical as we are. I think um, the issue is when it comes to the Quranic manuscripts, it has many scripts. Quran has been in the hands of Muslims probably since they were written. Or like worst, worst scenario, the Topkapı Musaf has been in Topkapı in Istanbul since 1811, 1, like over a hundred years ago. 1811. And yeah, so that was the date it was passed to the Topkapı. It's been there over 100 years. 108 years it's been in, in, in Istanbul. And when did we get the Altı Kulaç's writings? 2007. So Up till 2002, no one had done a study of it. Yeah, so it, it has been in their hands, and no one even bothered to explain what is inside. Informations have been in the hands of Muslims, and in the mosques, you've been lied to. Coins, they didn't turn up the they maybe they turned up to the British Museum a couple of months ago, but they were in the hands of Muslims and they were accessible. But none of you bothered to explain the humanity, historical mistakes Islam makes. Same yeah. for the mosques, they've been built from the time of Muhammad, but none of you bothered to explain the humanity. Oh, actually, had. Apparently, headquarter of um, Islam or the direction of the prayer was Petra. So, because your imams, your sheikhs, your dawa gangs are lying to you, therefore, Christians, who, who, Jay is very busy over there, but he's making time to put things together for you. It's up to you. You can use the brain Allah give it to you, and then say, oh, why? Like, if I was Muslim. All I would do is I would go to the, my imam and then say, why have you been lying to me? Here's the historical evidence, and I am hearing this from Christians. Just go and question your imam. And what he's going to do, he's going to give you the unpacking of the surah 5 verse 110. You can't question, therefore life is happily after. Atun, I think this is a, you're bringing up a problem that has existed I think in Islam, uniquely in Islam. I don't know of any other faith or any other religion that is not self-critical. I have yet to see Islam being self-critical. The What we are using today is redacted criticism and source criticism. Where do you think redacted criticism and source criticism were created? They were created on this book here, the Bible. Redacted criticism, source criticism, historical criticism, literary criticism, all these criticisms that we now use all over the world on many different documents were all begun in the 1800s by criticizing this book. Christians were the ones who did it. We were These were not non-Christians. Wellhausen and many others, they were all Christians who were criticizing and doing great criticism. They were asking very good 
historical questions. They ask questions of whether or not Abraham even existed. How could there be writing at the time of Moses in 1400 BC? There was no writing that early. They were asking, where are these cities called Sodom and Gomorrah? Where is the city called Ur? They were asking very good historical questions. They pretty much said that we can throw out the first 11 chapters of Genesis because there's no historical support for any of this person, especially the person of Abraham or somebody living in Euphrates coming to Canaan. So these were all very good questions, but they were Christians that were asking them. And by 1905, it really decimated the church all over Europe. The Europe, European church has not recovered since then. Since 1905, we've gone back and we've looked and researched and we've gone back to, we found the Mari tablets, we found the Nuzi tablets, we found the Ebla tablets, we found the Amarna tablets, these four genre of tablets, which now supported the whole a story of Abraham, showing that we've got the right man at the right place, doing the right customs, even at the right time. And these some of these customs went out of date by 1600 BC. There's no way that Moses writing in 1400 BC could have even known of these customs. How did he get it so correct? It's proving that the Bible has gone through that test. But it was Christians who were the ones that were testing the Bible. Now, show me a Muslim that's done the same type of criticism against the Quran. Show me a Muslim that's asked the questions we've asked today about these, these coins. Why is it when Hattun ta asked me to come to the British Museum, she wanted me to look at these coins because she knew immediately by what, just walking into that one gallery that there are some problems with what the British Museum was saying. The dates were not wrong. The significance of those dates was the problem. She saw immediately, how can you have images on coins in 661 in a Muslim uh, in a Muslim caliphate. And what about Abdul Malik? If he is the, one of the greatest of the Islamic Muslim caliphs, what's he doing with his image on there? And what in the world, how is it that the Shahada is introduced at this date, 692, and no one's paying attention? Now, why is it that Hattu noticed this and no one else has noticed that? And she brought me along to look at it. I give her explain, and, she, and she, that's why we're having this live stream today. She said, Jay, we've got to unpack this. You've got to help us with this. Because listen, I noticed this. We noticed this way back in the 1990s. This is not new to me. We first noticed this when we went to the numismatic section of the British Museum. And we saw these coins in sequence. And we saw the images. And so I knew this way back in 1994. 1994, we're talking about 25 years ago, I've known about this problem. But how is it that I can see this, and I'm not even an expert on in numismatics, this is not my area of expertise. Why is it that the British Museum, who are supposedly assumed that they have experts on Islam, are putting these coins up there, and they're not even coming up with any significance, they're not even coming up with a problem. They're looking at these coins that they don't even see the significance of what they're looking at. That's why we're having this discussion today. And we'll be having more of these discussions, Hatun. This is not the last we're going to do of this. Uh, the fact that almost in every case, when you look at the Quran today, when you look at the work that's going on at looking on manuscripts, look at the names of those who are doing the work on the manuscripts. Look at the ones who are dating them. None of them, all, in fact, almost, all, I should say that, almost none of them are Muslim names. They are all European names. They're Americans. These are not, almost all of them are not Christians. None of them have any religion. But they are all experts in their field. They are all linguists, most of them. They have to be. They have to know these languages. I remember when I went to Dr. Patricia Corona in Cambridge when I did my first debate in 1995. Look at the date, 1995. That's almost 25 years ago when I first debated Jamal Badawi on the problem with Mecca. I gave 10 historical challenges. Dr. Patricia Corona was the one. I used all her material. Dr. Patricia Corona reads and writes 15 languages. What in the world, can you show me any Muslim that reads and writes 15 languages, and she is the one that has gone to the very place where Islam was birthed and asked some of the most damaging questions that have yet to be answered, especially questions concerning Mecca. She is the first one to find the first reference to the city of Mecca in 741. How can no one else have known that? Why is it Muslims didn't know that? You remember when you had your discussion with Dan Gibson just two weeks ago? Remember the question you asked him about Mecca? And he talked about going and seeing these Muslim scholars who came from Mecca. He had a discussion with them, and he asked them a simple question. Can you tell me, 
Have you found anything in Mecca? You're the archaeologist. You're the ones that are digging in the ground. All these big, these big skyscrapers that are being dug, they're having to dig into the ground to build the foundations. Aren't you there watching when they build the foundation? Aren't they bringing things up? Because when you dig down to build foundations, you start coming across artifacts. That's why archaeologists always come to big buildings when their big skyscrapers are being built. And what was their answer? Do you remember what he said? There is nothing there. Nothing there. The only thing they could find was a Turkish fort. An old Turkish fort from the Ottoman period. Nothing exists outside of this Turkish fort. But that's, that's from the 1400s. Jay, that shows how powerful Turkish uh, Ottoman Empire was. We love the living life, sharing life with people. We went their land and then we left evidence that we've been there. Um, I just love it. Now, listen, um, we're going to have to hold do a whole nother life. <laughs> on what Dan Gibson has now found about all of the I love what he has found if you look at his videos he's come up with now and he can now show that every one of the stations of the Hajj the stations the Muzdalifa the Safan Marwa the uh, running back and forth between these two hills the la, la, uh, ablution ponds the cisterns even the cisterns where the water comes from even the hut, even the Kaaba itself are the right dimensions. Everything that you can find, even the Jamarats where they throw the 49 stones, the 72 stones of the Jamarats, that every one of them can be found in Petra. And what's more, the dimensions are exactly like what they find in the later traditions, which do not parallel the Kaaba that we have today. Ooh, I love it. We're going to have to do a whole other live stream just on this new material that he's come up with. Um, what we have is... When you try to compare Islam with, with history, remember Islam is very powerful religion which has been followed by 1.8 billion and it is apparently so true, truth. Yet, when you compare that with history, history just crushes it. We can't even find anything linked with Islam in the history. That's the sad, sad reality of tonight. Hatun, it's been great doing this with you. We've taken about an hour and a half to go through the coins. I would love to do a live stream looking at what we now know about Petra and what we now know about Mecca. I would like a look. I would like to look at the Meccan, the 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 uh, the, um, the inscription, the Meccan inscription yep. uh, that points to. This is exciting to me. This is one of the most exciting things that points to six ninety seven that the Masjid Al-Haram was built in 697. Oh, two, 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 two. look at the date. That the Masjid Al-Haram was not built to 697 and the reason why it was built. These are things we need to unpack, we need to discuss. But before we do that, we need to get the images of all of this and I'll send them to you. So we need to do another live stream. We need to look at also the black rock. We need to start looking at the significance of the black stone yeah. that comes. We need to look at the significance of Ibn Zubair. All of this needs to be unpacked. There's so much new material here, Hatun, that we have to do a number of live streams on this. We can do one just before Christmas. We can do one just before Christmas, yeah. yeah. I'll get to with you and we'll announce each other. But can you see, just with these coins, can you now see how Islam Jay. is being formed? You can follow the evolution Jay, of Jay, Islam Jay. with these coins. Jay, I can see it. But the issue is, after it's 10.30 here, after this time, Muslims are still being lied and lied and lied. The question <laughs> is, when yeah. are they going to take off their sunglasses and see? That's the question. If you well, see, listen, it, go to, to your dying. sheikhs, speak go to, to your dawah gangs, and then get out Islam as soon as you can. If you want to ask, if you notice what Hatun and I have been doing, and the question that came up, how can we trust you? You're not a Muslim. Can you notice that everything that we have used today, we're not speaking as a Christian. This is not a Christian polemic. Have we talked about, except looking at Genesis 37, verse 28, and comparing the story of Joseph with Surah 12, Ayah 20. That's the only time we did a comparison with the Bible. Am I correct today? Yeah. We've only looked at that comparison, and that's a significant comparison because it's a historical comparison. Everything we've said about these coins is a historical argument. Remember, the historical argument is the best argument you can use because it is absolutely neutral. Anybody can uh, look at what we're looking at. Anybody can see if we're lying. Please do. 
Anybody can look at the coins, go to the gallery, go in the numismatic sections, go up online, and just look at the earliest Arab coins. I'm not saying Muslim coins, I'm saying Arab coins, the Sufyani coins, the, the Byzantine uh, drachma before that. And then especially look at Abdul Malik. We're going to keep on coming back to Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik is a kingpin. We're going to keep coming back to this. But what we're saying and everything that we have done, and this is why I've said to many Muslims, the biggest, the Achilles heel of Islam is the historical problems, are the historical problems. I believe that it is these kinds of questions, not just on the coins, the problem with Mecca, the problem with Petra, the problem with the Qibla, the problem with the Quran, the problem with the manuscripts, the problem with the fragments, the problem with almost everything that we have been bringing up in the last two years. In every case, these are neutral problems. These are historical problems. And in order for any religion to, to be able to be classified as a truth, a, a religion of truth, it has to pass the historical test. Only Christianity has passed that historical test. Only the Bible has been attacked for 200 years on every one of these criticisms, redacted, source, literary, historical criticism. The documentary hypothesis, you name it. We have been attacked and attacked and attacked. And to date, remember what not Dr. Nelson Gluck said, there is not one artifact anywhere in the world that controverts a properly understood <coughs> biblical statement. No other book can, ma can make that claim but the Bible. So we as Christians understand best why historical criticism is so devastating. We understand how it devastated the Bible up till 1905. Now we're in 2019, it's no longer devastating the Bible. In fact, I love historical criticism. The more attacks we get, the more we can answer them. That's why you do the Bible tour of the British Museum. And anybody that wants to go to the British Museum with Hatun, go with her, because she'll take you and show you all these artifacts from the Assyrian period, from the Babylonian period, from the Persian period that supports the Bible in the British Museum. God bless the British for stealing it all and putting it into one building. And you can do that. Call, and uh, you are doing still tours on it, are you not, Hatu? Yeah. Yes. Beth sir. Grove is also doing tours on it, and I know others are doing it. I think Sarah uh, Lumger is also doing tours on it. So these are people that are in Britain, that are in London, who will do these tours. I am now putting a tour together of the Museum of the Bible here in Washington, doing, looking at the same artifacts. They've got almost exact same artifacts that you have in the British Museum. They brought it to Washington, D.C., and they put it in the Museum of the Bible. And now we have a 45-minute tour. That, I'm sorry, it's almost an hour-long tour that looks at all these artifacts that supports the Bible. That kind of tour is not being done on the Quran because that kind of tour cannot be done on the Quran because we don't find artifacts that support the Quran. In fact, we find just the opposite. And that's why Muslims, if you're listening to us, you're going to have to come up with a better response. You can't just sit there and attack us. Don't just say we're, we're, we're not right. This is not right because we're not Muslims. Therefore, we can't ask, ask these questions. The only ones who are asking these questions are non-Muslims. Where are the Muslims asking these questions? Where are the Muslims doing this kind of research? Why is it we can't find any Muslims who are critiquing this book? They dare not do it because if you were to do it, you would not live very long. This is the only area of study that I know where what you find and what you say publicly can kill you. We don't kill people for criticizing the Bible. Because we it, do not it kill, kill people. Of peace. It is not a religion of peace. I know you love to say that, Hatun. You keep on drilling it into our heads. You're trying to persuade us, but you do it tongue in cheek. I know you're doing it uh, facetiously, and God bless you for trying. But you're never going to persuade anybody because the more you say it, the more we find it is anything but the religion of peace. But, Henry, folks, please come back to a book that has gone through the test. Come back to a book that does stand to every historical critique. Come back to the book that points to one man. And who's that man? His name is Jesus Christ. And we always end with Jesus Christ. Every, every live stream we do, we want to end with him. Because here's what this book is all about. It's all about Jesus. It's all about him. And we always want to talk about him because he is worthy to not only be worshipped, he is worthy to be praised because of what he did on the cross 2,000 years ago. That also can be historically validated. And I thank God that we can validate the crucifixion. We can validate the resurrection. Because if we, he did not die, he did not rise again, I'm damned and so is everybody else. And I don't want to be damned. I want to go to heaven. I want to be with God again. And the only way I can do that is if God has forgiven my sins for me. Come on home, Muslims. And any of you who are skeptical, please come on home to the Bible. We love to have you. It's love to be able to talk with you. We'll continue with these live streams. And we'll be unpacking more areas. His, 
always we're going to the historical areas because no one else is doing this. Notice Hatun at DCCI, myself with Fander Films, Al Fadi with Sira International, Sam Shumin, Shamunian uh, with uh, Shamunian uh, is doing it. David Wood is starting to do it. And we're starting finally to get a few others who are starting to come on uh, to uh, sorry, uh, uh, who are starting to come into the historical critique. We need to get more of you who are doing the historical critique, because this is what I think is going to bring more Muslims to Christ than anything else. Um, Jay, um, thank you for joining us on the live stream, especially taking time from your um, work. And thank you very much for those of you who joined us in the chat. If you had a burning question that you wrote it, but we skipped it or we didn't reply, feel free to drop email to info at dccministries.com and then we can um, arrange something to deal with your question. Thank you very much to admin for um, controlling the chat and we will see you at Speaker's Corner or in heaven or around. Um, Jay, once again, thank you very much. I'll see you next week. Okay. Thank you. God bless you, Hatun. It's been great being with you. We'll do it again. Thank and you. next time we'll have a whole other area to talk about. Thank you. Until then, God bless you, everybody.